So, well, my name is Erika de la Vega. I'm from Venezuela. I have been living here for six years. And um, I'm a TV presenter, I'm a comedian, podcaster, and whatever else that something goes on, I will do it. Um, but the thing is, I tell you where I'm from because I'm not in the fashion industry. I'm, always, I'm a victim of it, but I'm not from the fashion industry. I'm not into it. I, I would love to know more about it and how to combine clothes and what is coming and have a lot of money to buy all the clothes that I want. But the thing here is that, that the good thing I want to be here is because now when we speak about fashion, we are like talking about sustainability and how we can do uh, a better planet, like respecting different um, uh, things like human ethical and different ways that we can work together so we can have a better impact in the society. It's weird because now, I don't know you, but as a consumer, I sometimes ask for, and this material, where is it from? I, any animal being damaged? You know, and that conversation, we, we didn't have it a long time ago. And I think the consumers that are worried about the materials and how the, the clothes were is from and what the brand is doing for the planet. If we insist in that conversation, I think we can impact the work of the different designers and the fashion industry. We are here today um, to learn because we have great speakers. Um, the first one I want to present is um, Lauren, Lauren Boker. Um, she, well, has done, uh, yes, how are you, Lauren? I, please, let me present you, yeah. <laughs> let me say nice words, I'm, I'm here for that, yeah. Well, she was born in Manchester in 1985. Um, she founded the Unseen, that's a brand, in 2012, she's a London-based design house that was established to inspire the next generation of thinkers, innovators, designers, and scientists towards disrupting the aesthetic of technology. In February 2017, she released Fire, the world's first color change hair dye, receiving more than seven million online views in the hours, in the first hours after lounge, and I appreciate that, because here in Miami, we change our color, but for the water. Yeah, not for your technology. So it's fun <laughs> to know about it. She has been commended by the British Fashion Council for digital innovation in fashion, and voted one of Creative Review's top 50 creative leaders in the industry. Welcome, welcome, welcome. You are on time. We're just present, presenting our first speaker. It's better you haven't been here to hear my English, my pronunciation. But we're doing well. It's going to be better. Well, Laudin is the winner of the WGSN Futures Award for Best Innovati Innovation Design in 2016. Having graduated from the Manchester School of Art, Lauren joined the Printed Textile MA at the Royal College of Art where she is now a visiting lecturer. Her graduate collection was shot by Tim Walker and modeled by Kate Moss. Well, we have it here. Let her be here and she explain all her work. Thank you, Lauren, for being here. You. How are you? <laughs> Thank you. Hey, guys. Thanks for having me. Um, nice to be here. It's amazing to be in Miami. How does this start? Ah, here we go. Um, so this is me. So my name's Lauren, I'm the founder of The Unseen. So The Unseen is a material exploration house and we, I founded it essentially because I'm really interested in invisible stuff. So whether that be data or whether it be climate change or whether it be emotions, um, I'm generally really curious about exploring the world that I live in both externally and internally. And how I do that is through science and design because it's my core skills. So that's alchemy to me, it's using what you know to discover and learn more about the world. Um, I've been super lucky to have presented and represent people like the UN, Dazed, um, Ted and Vogue and Wired, but I won't kind of stay on that because it's 
slightly boring. Um, I'll play a little bit, uh, a video which introduces the brand um, a little bit better than me. We believe in a world where pollution is made real when objects expose emissions. Where surfaces recolor at the flip of a switch. A world where you can visualize pain and anticipate illness. Or see the strength within your body. Not just for tomorrow, this world is now. Today, we are creating a more intelligent future, combining science and technology with design. Using color to communicate data. By developing color changing materials, compounds and coatings. Responsive to multiple triggers. We offer applications tailored to you in your world. To see is to believe. What will you see? Come back on. So you can, oh, you don't need to clap. <laughs> it's so American, this clapping thing. But um, so you can see uh, we have a range of different clients and work across all different sectors from the NHS through to Selfridges. Um, and that's predominantly because we work with material. Um, and my background's in science, so I was a scientist originally, um, very interested in communicating unseen stuff, like I said, through materials. Um, but once I created, uh, started creating the science, I started to think, well, how should this science and how should these dyes be applied? And I thought the best way to understand how science should be applied is to learn it, so to study design. Um, my first... Um, Ever compound was a, a compound uh, that I invented when I was 18, which changes color to air pollution. So um, as an 18 year old, I was really pissed off with the world and a bit like, why can't I? Um, I, I have a back disability and I was in hospital a lot and I was really frustrated with how to communicate pain. Um, so when I got back to university, it didn't make sense to just do fashion for fashion's sake. I really wanted to create something that had impact within the world and sort of answered the angsty 18 year old of myself. So I forced my way over to the chemistry department, said I was gonna study chemistry with no back background in science um, and luckily they let me on which was insane um, and we cre I created this compound over um over four years, which uh, changes its color from yellow to black to let you know how much carbon emission you've absorbed um, on a daily basis, and then it reverses in a less densely polluted atmosphere. Um, and I had this like moment of clarity where I was like, wow, if I give you your carbon emission footprint as data, you'll listen to it for five minutes. Whereas if I put you in this garment and put you behind a bus, I'll put you in the middle of strand uh, on a flag or on a bus itself as a car pane, and it changes color, then hopefully you know, you'll have an emotional connection to that, and then you'll want to go on and change the way that you live. So um, this began my kind of journey into the idea of using materials to communicate invisible stuff, hence the unseen. Um, the second collection that I launched, um, or second technology innovation that we launched, was in collaboration with Formula One. So it was a formula that tracks aerodynamic across the car. So in real time, um, looking at the, the sort of surface of the aerodynamics of the car on the surface of the paint and allowing um, the designers and the engineers to see that in real time. So it was a compound that went from black, red, green, and blue and changed its color uh, as the wind hits it to friction. So this is a jacket in a similar, similar, similar formula which um, shows you the human aerodynamics dynamics associated the human as they're moving about the earth's environment and um, changing its color to the friction as you, these turbulence you create and it's quite unseen but you create a, um, a sort of aerodynamic shift across the top of your um, shoulder which then turbulates as a kind of angel wings behind your back so it's a really beautiful invisible pattern um, that we wanted to showcase so this is it um, in its uncontrolled state so it just does its own thing you can't control it which is really beautiful as the, the environment of earth changes the garment responds and fluctuates with it Time responding to it, but then I think the. Con
control freak in me was like, this is great, it's really uncontrolled, but how do I create something that's a little bit more controlled? Um, so I made an identical sister sculpture and sister, sister formula, um, which changed its colours um, on a more uh, 24 hour base period. So it starts off black, um, then goes to red, then green, then blue, um, which you can see in the next image, the next video, um, just fluctuating as the earth um, warms up and then cools down throughout the day. And then we went on to do a few seasonal um, lines with Liberty that was uh, environment responsive curtains, so they changed to um, seasons. But I think for me this is just a really um, important element of remembering that you're on the earth and that the earth has its own being and its own things going on. Just because we're here doesn't mean that we don't, that the earth isn't doing its own thing. So by visualizing the kind of temperature patterns or UV patterns that are happening on a daily basis, hopefully it sparks awareness in the, um, the wearers to like respect uh, nature a little bit more. Um, the next project that we worked on as part of the same collection was a collaboration with Swarovski, which when Swarovski originally came to me to ask to collaborate, I was like, no way, no, God, that's such a polluted, horrible industry, I don't want to be a part of it. But then they were like, come to Austria, we'll show you what we're doing in our research laboratory. So I went over to Swarovski Gemstones, which is a slightly different division than Swarovski Crystals, um, and they showed me a facility where they were lab growing gemstones. And this moment in me just kind of went, this is incredible. If you can lab, lab grow um, synthetic gemstones, why the hell are we mining gemstones in the world? Um, so we went on to do a piece which um, really broke ground for Swarovski because they really didn't want to speak about the fact that they had this uh, uh, synthetic modification of, of nature in a way. Um, but I thought, well, if we're going to create gemstones from scratch, why not create them to have something that nature's gemstones don't have to make them more valuable, make them more kind of precious to as an object and also give us something that we can't naturally get from the earth? Hopefully that will stop people from mining. Um, so I created one gemstone um, and then cloned it 4,000 times. And inside of the gemstone, I added a ceramic plate, which changes its color in 0.5 of a degree five times. Um, and then I worked with King's College Neuros de Neurology Department in London um, to track the brain data of the human um, and the thermal regulation, so the heat patterns across the brain. And because each of these gemstones are cloned, they're identical sisters, they um, essentially act as like mini pixels that change their color depending on where is active within the brain. So for me, I'm really obsessed with visualizing pain because I'm in pain a lot. Um, but if you have a broken arm, you probably, you'll go to the doctors. If you have a chemical imbalance or something wrong with your brain, you'll ignore it most of the time. So I really wanted to use this piece as a kind of art piece to really open up the conversation about there is more going on inside the body than we know. And we should, should be you know, able to communicate and talk about that and understand it. Um, and what's great about the piece is everybody who's worn it has generated a completely different patination and color range, which is super cool. Um, and once we launched it um, into the world, it, it was part of an art exhibition with um, Paris Pompidou, uh, uh, I can't remember what it's called, Modern Art Museum of Art. But the, um, it opened, I had all of these neuroscientists coming to me saying, oh my God, can we use this technology to visualize people that are in like, maybe comas or like understanding what is going on with somebody, even a child who can't communicate in the language that we, we can communicate, um, which was, you know, this is not an MRI scan. It's never gonna be an MRI scan. That's not what it's about. It's about purely opening up the conversation and allowing somebody a tactile surface. So using materials to um, communicate and, I don't know, create a more emotional experience when you're at the doctors or you're at the hospital. Um, after that, we started a project with um, the Innovate UK and the British Fashion Council over in, in England, um, which is a slight step on from the technology you just saw. So whereas everything I've previously shown is all chemically responsive, so it responds to the environment or the human in a chemical way, this is a digitally activated piece. So it's a surface that changes its color to human EEG brainwaves. So we collaborated with um, a company called Holition in the UK, which are incredible digital uh, geniuses they basically can do everything with data um, and then I formulated a, a, an ink which will change its color to electrical signals and then we held therapy sessions at fashion week which was hilarious because everyone got red but the piece um, changes its color to your emotional state at the time you are wearing it so if you are anxious happy sad you get uh, anxious brings out red colors happy brings out yellow colors willingness to learn and teach can, brings out a green color and then if you're in a meditative state and um, the piece goes white uh, so it was a really amazing in kind of uh, it, it experience for me because I got to see all of these people in front of me responding with the piece and people brought along music, they brought along films, they brought along objects really to try and like evoke an emotion that they could see in the garment that they were wearing 
their emotion to this object, which really was, you know, an incredible experience to have and, and has inspired a lot of the research that we're doing going forward into how we can use these materials to help us, I guess, just learn and um, navigate this crazy life that we have. Um, after that, we, we worked with Selfridges because a lot of what we do was art pieces and, um, and we really wanted to make it real and put stuff out into the real world. Um, but I'm not a massive kind of advocate of, of, fa of fashion in itself, which is kind of a bad thing to say at a fashion summit. But I feel like um, what, we did, what I did with the, the money that Selfridges gave us to create a collection was use that to put it straight back into research to robust all of my formulas into a manufacture um, world. So how do, if I'm going to create these new molecules and get them out to real people, then they have to pass certain regulations and certain all sorts of different wear tests, etc. Um, and at the time, we were working on a bandage for the NHS, which um, changes its color to um, muscle tensions and to um, the patination around, around sort of chronic wounds with uh, people that are stuck in bed for a long time. But we didn't have the money to go through those tests, so we used the Selfridges Project to do those tests. So hence the silk scarf. <laughs> so the silk scarf actually, in its sense, is a massive bandage. So um, we tracked a lot of data, and it changes its color basically depending on where the muscles you put it, how tightly you wrap it around your arms, etc. cetera. Um, luxury piece, but actually all of that research then informed our, our, our research for um, other projects, which was a cool thing. Um, we created a backpack which changes its color around the world, so depending on where you take it, it will never be the same color. So it literally just responds to the wind, to the UV, to all the different stuff and goes crazy. So if I'm in London or New York, it's different colors. Um, and then a seasonal um, bag which changes its color with the seasons, so it's um, red in the summer, blue in the winter, green in the spring. Um, same with these wrist straps. The longer you wear them, the longer they will change color. So if you have it on for a week, you might get to a different color than if you have it on for 10 minutes, for example. And then you take them off and they reset. So I'm really trying to like promote this idea of maintaining your object and like holding on to something that you want to pass down to your child and their child and, and so on and so on. And not you know, something that you create a connection with because then hopefully you know, it's a, a little bit more important to you. Um, we did a really cool project with Virgin Galactic. Um, so... Virgin came to us and asked whether we could work with them on their future astronauts um, journey as if going to space isn't you know, as big of an experience as, uh, as you can have. They wanted, um, they were, we were really lucky to, to work on their um, astronaut patch. So the most memorable thing, I guess, from space travel is the NASA patches and the kind of cool badges that all the astronauts have. Um, so we were thinking, well, how do we create a memory or a badge of honor for somebody um, that's in this really unique setting and you know, one of the first? So I went out to the desert and tracked all of the environment that the um, person, the future astronaut, will go through. Um, and they, you know, they have their suits and their suits are on the peg, they're on the shelf and then they're wearing their suits and then they're going into space. So there's all these different crazy environments. Um, so I created a color story that means the patch, when it's not on the body, is black, so it's almost dormant, so the eye is closed. And then when, it's, when you wear the patch, it responds to this earth, so it changes to wind, to UV, to carbon emissions, to our uh, natural atmosphere. And then when you go to space, the patch changes its color to virgin galactic blue because it's a commercial project, and, um, and, and remains that so it essentially breaks so that when you come back down to earth you have a blue patch and the patch will only go blue if you are, have gone to space so it's a little bit of a badge of honor but also again like promoting this idea of these yes you're having this experience but you're going into different worlds and um, bringing something back and wanting to talk about it and communicate about it I mean going to space is going to be cool enough as in itself but you know if you want a badge, there, there they are. Um, so I'm also a UN climate change ambassador. So I do a lot with um, the education system here in the US on trying to promote young girls within science. So it's a very small percentage of um, girls that are in science um, for various different reasons. But um, for me, I was kind of like, well, you know, how do I get kids in general speaking about science? So I created a project around water. And um, everything we do that I've shown you so far is around color change. but Changed, you probably remember from like the 90s, these hypercolor t-shirts, which were incredibly bad and really toxic um, and always broke when you put them over a certain amount of temperature. So I thought, well, how do I create like a modern hypercolor um, that's fun, that's playful, that allows people to get off their phones and get back into nature and, and really play? So I created a formula um, which changes its color to every time it comes in contact with water. So it changes to pH um, and switches through different colors depending on the pH scale that it hits. And then we made the formula open source. So I did like a how-to and it's essentially a cabbage dye, which is super fun. So it's kitchen chemistry that you, anyone can do um, and dye their t-shirts. And then the idea was that you, 
you get your, your t-shirt, it comes out purple because you dye it in a pH neutral bath, and then you go out, explore your world, wash your t-shirt, jump in a lake, throw your water over yourself, and the t-shirt will change its color to let you know the pH of that, of that t-shirt. We launched this on the week that Trump pulled out the Paris Climate Change um, Agreement um, at the White House, so it was an incredibly bonkers time. Um, but then we, we went around, um, I, I did this in collaboration with the Lost Explorer, so a friend of mine, David de Rothschild, took them to all of these places that he was exploring and um, built up a color map. So this is Iceland, London was blue, um, I'll wash mine here while I'm here and then see what color Miami comes out, but I washed it in the White House's um, in found, fountain, which I'm not going to talk about, but <laughs> not the place to talk about it, I do want to leave America at some point. Um, and then, uh, yeah, the whole idea is like live curiously, go do, like play. Um, it was just a really fun project. And then as um, you mentioned before, for another kind of awareness project, I'm also the science editor at Days, um, purely out of fun, not, not for any kind of anything else other than just to, again to encourage a younger audience to get into science and to care about the world that, and themselves that we live in and, and we live in our bodies first. Um, so I thought, what's the best way to encourage young girls into fashion, it, sorry, into science? Um, well makeup cosmetics like you know girls are very interested in becoming new people and becoming like finding their characters at that age um and i was watching a, a witchcraft film which is called the craft from like the 90s and the girl goes like this and changes the color of her hair and at the time i had really long hair and my housemate just said to me oh you should do that because my hair was always dipping in formulas and like when I'm in the screen print studio when I'm in the lab I'm not the safest chemist happy to say my head of science goes mad but um, I'm always like covered in color change whenever I go outside my hands change color like there's pollution I'm like oh god you know like literally everything always changes color so I knew that I could create it so we just did a video um, of a hair dye which changed its color in exactly that way so as the temperature gradients shifted um, it went from black to red which you can see here in a really really short snippet I spent no money on this video it was literally just a fun awareness project to announce me being science editor but also then to kind of rate it was also the first time that um, women in science day fell on um, fashion week so it was kind of like a nice uh, bringing togetherness and then it actually got 70 million views not seven <laughs> overnight which was um, absolutely insane and then brought all of these incredible well I don't know whether they're incredible but all of these technology uh, the chemical industries uh, cosmetic industries to us um, asking for the dye and we were like hey, hey it's just a concept like it's not a commercial piece so for the past two years we've been working in collaboration with a world leader um, to bring this product to life but in a very um, conscious way so in our terms that's why it's taken two years I'm not going to release anything that is worse than what's already out in the atmosphere um, and then really hope to use this kind of messaging to get across other messages. So if people start to care about the vision and how they look and products that are in the world, so cosmetics, to talk about a sustainability angle, cosmetics, you know, majority of cosmetics are made from petrol. So that's, you know, we, we think about carbon emission and we think about transport and we think about cars and we think about all the other stuff. But actually the stuff we're wearing on our face is really, really toxic. So how do we start to um, think about that messaging and, and, and really kind of create one product that benefits us and also benefits the environment? Um, so I launched Hather, which was a project a couple of last year, which is around makeup, um, which is all, um, again, about personalization and, and um, fluctuation uh, of, of makeup. So why, for example, do we have like 50 million concealers and 50 million shades of lipstick why can we not just create one shade that activates and changes so they're less product but that will do multiple things it will respond to you and at the same time like our skin is alive like it's always changing color it changes temperature it changes conductivity it just changes all the time so like why are we putting this dumb stuff onto our skin that a isn't good for it and b doesn't you know just masks what's going on on the surface of our body and for me i really think of the skin as a barrier between the world and um, our inner us. So, well, not just a barrier, but a kind of like communication membrane. It's fabric in itself. So, this is just a blusher that changes to the world. So, it changes its color to the environment and as the wind passes across it. Um, but this piece is a self forming freckle serum. So, it's an SPF sunscreen that you put onto your skin um, and then it self forms invisible freckles until you go out into the sun and then the, um, the freckles appear uh, depending on how much. Um, SPF, uh, sorry, how much UVA, UVB rays hit the skin. So you could, there's two versions of it. One is reversible, so then you come back inside and they disappear, and the other one will stay and set until you take the makeup off. But the idea is that kind of like, um, I don't know, like protecting the skin, because the sunkissed look is obviously like, you know, everyone loves it, but 
we don't have to these days go and burn our skin to do it. Like science can help us achieve the looks that are in fashion or whatever or the ways, but in much more intelligent ways. So um, I'm a great believer of, of using the industry to get your message across in, uh, you know, it, hacking into them in a way so the reason I set my studio up straight underneath the British Fashion Council in Somerset House because I believed that by bringing new molecules to the fashion industry I'd be able to get them across other sectors so that I don't know that's kind of like the end of my pro end of my presentation I don't know how long I've been but I know I talk really fast and waffle on um, but yeah a quick snapshot of some of our projects there's lots lots more like the flag which we presented at the press conference which uses the pollution compound from the first slide um, which yeah changed its color over Somerset House um, Cool. Come again? One minute. Did that really fast. Okay. Um, we're going to have a few minutes for questions and answers. I have a lot of questions for you. Does your products are, can be found here in the United States? No. So they, Well, yeah, they will be from the end of summer. Um, a lot of the fashion pieces were just small, small limited collections. So we did, I don't really want to continue them as, as mass manufactured products. So, mm -hmm. um, but the cosmetic products will all be globally available from um, end of summer. Nice. And the second question is, are they expensive because of technology? No, they're okay. Like, so I mean, I mean, I, the different prices depending on what one, different ones do. But um, no, like affordable. Um, you know, yeah, depends. Like okay. a treatment. I'm thinking of it more as like eventually they will be kind of like mass manufactured and and whatever. But only when it's right and when the formulas are mm -hmm. right and and everything is kind of yeah, not damaging the world as it as incredible. It, it could be. Yeah. Okay, now every, anybody has a question because I can continue. <laughs> Um, we have a microphone. You can just raise your hand and we, uh huh, over there. We reach you the, the microphone. Uh huh, over there. Actually, me. Yep. I, but I have a microphone. Hi, how are you? I. I just want to ask you how you went and created the ink that's going to change the color because of the emotion. That's just mind-blowing. Yeah. Tuss, tuss. Um, trial and error, <laughs> so working really hard and sitting Hello. in a lab like this. Um, we work a lot in collaboration with different universities to collect the data, so I, as long as the data exists then I can program the chemistry. So I have this unique set of skills where I'm very knowledgeable in the creation of the actual molecule, molecule because that's where I did my under, undergrad degree in, but then I also did my masters in design and uh, an application printed textiles, so I understand the fabric. So if I've got like a molecule over here that might normally sit in a concrete or might normally sit in a car paint or or I don't know, like something else, a medicine, um, I can look at it and think, okay, well, how do I get that into a fabric? So there's lots of things within healthcare that'll change, like sensors that will, intelligent labels that change in certain ways, but they're not often brought across to industries like fashion or design, etc. So I'll work with those molecules and um, innovate on them to sit within compounds and then make program them to um, change color to data streams that we collect with universities. So for the emotion one, we looked at EEG. So um, the brain, brain activity is an interesting one. We say emotion, but actually like monitoring emotion is like, you can't do it. It's, 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 you can look at the data and you can plot a kind of line, but is it right? We don't know because no one really knows what someone's thinking inside. You can only kind of make an educated guess off lots of data. Um, so we look at the data, we find a kind of red thread and then we program a chemical formula to respond to that thread. If that makes sense. I don't know, yeah. a bit science <laughs> Yeah, just uh, listening to you, you, you have the, one have the impression that actually is just uh, seeing the future, uh, not only of the uh, fashion world, but many other things. Yeah. Uh, I, I would like to, to know is some of the products, and uh, because this is probably one of the questions that everybody that is going to consume those products is going to ask themselves, uh, I will. You know, if in some way they are going to affect you, mm -hmm. where one of those t-shirts is going to just affect your skin or the products that you have, yeah. you know, the makeup product, the freckle thing, uh, how can you apply that and, uh, and if it's going to affect you in some way? That, yeah. that's no, I think you, it, in terms of like a health benefit, no, it doesn't have any effect. So it passes all of the to to toxicology standards that a, a formula has to um, pass. And a lot of the compounds come from organic chemistry. So they're coming from salt. They're coming from kind of very um, earth substances. They're not 
harsh chemicals that you're putting onto your face, etc. And if anything, I would actually say they add benefit to you because rather than you going outside to get freckles, we're giving you a way that you can have freckles but safely. So it's an SPF. So you, you apply it like a serum and then it self forms the freckles within the serum in a kind of I don't know whether you've ever seen like a, those paints that you can you can paint onto a canvas and then they sort of crackle or they go into like weird like it's like an oil if you put an oil into a water you get like globules little dots so it's it's a similar science to that and then um, you put it onto your skin it dries and as it dries it forms invisible kind of tiny speckles um, and then they respond to the environment so they change their structure at the chemical space so we could get onto a colour conversation here where what is colour because colour actually is a structural shift that then gives you your eye perceives it in a different way so um, essentially the molecules are changing their structure from I don't know a circle to a line for example and then that reflects a light differently which gives you a different colour so they don't harm you in any way then they're, they're not um, harmful uh, to the to the supply chain to the kind of washability etc toxicology um, and hopefully yeah it gives you the opportunity to have one product that does the job of 10 products so therefore you're minimizing your waste um, and for, I don't know for me you've got to start somewhere like and you've got to start somewhere that to create get a message you've got to start somewhere that people understand which is clothing and uh, makeup yeah I, you know I'm could be this a solution for me? I, I, I explain myself. I'm an actor, yep. and I use a lot of makeup, yeah. and I am allergic to it. Yeah. And I don't know exactly what I am allergic to. I thought it was alcohol for many years, but if I just uh, touch the makeup and I do this in my eyes in yeah. the scene, it may happen that uh, in the next half an hour, my eyes are going to be red, yeah. and I, I have a very strong reaction to yeah. makeup of any kind, actually. This could be a solution for me? Absolutely, yeah. It could be a sensor. And also, you know, imagine if you think of patients within a hospital that can't communicate. Maybe they're in a coma or maybe they just don't speak the same language. If you can put, a, or a child, for example, if you can put a, a Vaseline or a cream on them um, that then communicates if they're overheating or if they've had an allergic reaction, then you, you can get, you can solve that, that a lot quicker. Um, if we take asthma, for an example, like the NHS um, lose something like 96 billion pounds a year to early admissions because people can't communicate what stage of an asthma attack they're having and misuse, mis, misuse of medication, so not understanding when to take their inhaler. But if you could see that within a watch face or a scarf or as a baby, a, you know, a, really a cream, then you can create action much more efficiently. So yeah, absolutely is a way of um, communicating something that you can't see in a very uh, human and uh, easy way to understand. Everyone can understand color apart from colorblind people, but we work on that with pattern, <laughs> so yeah. Hi, hey. I'm very amazed about what you have created, and especially it took a woman in science to actually yeah, yeah. come out with that, so <laughs> congratulations. Uh, you actually mentioned already something that I was gonna ask you, but, um, how do you relate what you have created, cre putting together science and fashion with possibly preventing illnesses mm. based on, you know, these molecules yep. that you're creating and that actually, you know, you already gave Antonio an answer on how that can apply, but can that be applied for like illnesses that can be prevented? Yeah, hopefully. I mean, the reason I started doing what I did was because I mentioned earlier in the talk, I have a back disability um, where I'm in constant chronic pain all the time, like a lot of pain. So when I go to the physio or my surgeon and he's like, OK, what's your pain scale? One to ten. I'm like, how that, that makes no sense to me. One to ten. How do I know that today's seven is not... 10 tomorrow like I, it didn't make sense and um, I'd see like my parents come and and like visit me in the hospital and then like they'd be really stressed and I was like no nah, I'm feeling fine today this is great so I was like well how do I find a way to communicate actually what I'm feeling that kind of puts everybody else at ease yes it could also diagnose something earlier but it could also from it also kind of, I don't know, it relieves that tension that a lot of people have and the confusion that people have around pain or something they can't understand. Um, and how do I do that in a very familiar way, which to me was colour because that's what I originally studied in college was design. So I was like, okay, colour and materials, I understand that. How do I communicate my pain through that, um, which took me on this massive journey. Um, but I think a lot of our work, this is a very artistic 
presentation but a lot of our work um, is done with pharmaceutical companies and healthcare to create intelligent labels and sensors on things like blood bags for third world countries that don't have the storage facilities that we have and, and uh, sensors that can very cheaply and very um, accurately change colour to whatever it has been influenced whatever has influenced it because nature does it amazingly so we're looking to nature to sort of like bring lessons from the trees that change their color seasonally that change their color to like we have these incredible plane trees in london that absorb pollution and change their patination at the same time you know like why can we not learn from that and bring that into our world because nature's existed a hell of a lot longer than we have so we should be listening to her that's amazing yeah i have a question you just presented us like a science fiction. No, I, I, I mean, I, everything I, I know, exists. I know, but I mean, no, I mean, and what Antonio also said, you just presented us like the future mm. where people can be more honest mm. because everything totally. is exposed, yep. you know, seeing the unseen. But you mentioned that you had an aha moment, an epiphany moment that you yeah. were like, can you explain what happened in that moment that you decided oh, to time ago. <laughs> start yeah. doing this? Uh, well, it was the moment that I was like, I don't know, like, I was really, really pissed off at 18. I was not the person that you would want to meet, I don't think. I was so angry that I had this... At 18, you want to be out partying with your friends. You don't want to be in a hospital bed. Um, and especially when you're on a design course and everybody else is, you know, finding out who they are and you're like, oh, I can't come because I've got my crutches. So I was kind of like... I don't know, the only way I channeled that was through working really hard and like I had this just really, I don't know, I had this crazy thing that was like, I want to make this molecule and I just was like, let's just do it. So I was sat, literally sat in a lab like this for four years and then um, when it worked, it was just a like, ah, oh, yes. Because I don't know, it just felt like an incredible, like all of that journey and that kind of pain didn't really matter anymore because this was my purpose. <laughs> that sounds really corny, but it felt like that. And then when I saw that in the solution, I was like, well, how do I apply that to something? And then sitting back and looking at that jacket, I was like, ah, okay. So if I can communicate carbon emission, what else can I communicate? Like, so pain for me is the holy grail. It's like my alchemy. Um, I still haven't got there hundred percent, but it, I'm getting close. And um, and I don't know when I solve that, God knows what happened, probably give it all up and do something else, but maybe not. But the, yeah, I don't know. It's like, I'm really curious and I get out of bed because I want to answer questions and see more that, that I haven't seen today, whether that's just meeting someone or whether that's like literally physically, you know, seeing what's going on in other areas. So yeah, curiosity. Everyone should be curious. Some elevator music. Uh -huh. See. We need a microphone that change colors. No. When it's on and it's when it's that. off. We need we need a tie. We need a tie. For, well, maybe again then we could give it to Trump and be like, "What's happening, oh, mate?" Yeah. <laughs> good, good morning, and uh, thank you for sharing your vision. Well, now concretely, uh, more than a vision. Um, I'd like to know. We saw a lot of famous brands and name mm -hmm. on your presentation. What, what, how do they welcome everything that you are now yeah. putting on the table? That, we know that fashion and technology mm. are probably one of the most fast changing mm. trends, right? And an industry, so is that just a trend because everybody is talking about sustainability and, mm. or is that really something that the industry is taking seriously from your perspective? From my perspective, they absolutely should be taking it seriously, yes. I think it's difficult because as a small entity, you know, we're a team of 15, we can go faster. We can, like, if I want to put something out to the world, I can do it tomorrow. Whereas a big conglomerate, whether it's a sportswear brand, a car company, a cosmetic company, they have all of this red tape. So yes, you might find certain individuals within the company that are like, yes, let's get this innovation out. But then they have to present it to 50 people above them, half of which don't know how to use the internet. You know, they're sitting on these boards that they didn't, they didn't grow up in the generation that had that. So how can they make these decisions that affect us and our world and, and, be, and younger people than me? Like, it, it's a very strange system. So it's hard. It's, it's definitely a battle every day. And, I, and from what I've shown you here, this is probably 5% of the projects we've done. For every, I don't know, 10 projects, one of them will see the light of the day and nine of them will fail and never, no one will ever see them. And people in business will be like, you can never speak about this just because it didn't get to commercial manufacture or whatever. Um, but that's just innovation. So I think, I don't really know how to answer your question because I'm constantly changing my opinion because it depends on who I meet. But for me, the successful projects have always come when I work with people who believe what we believe from day one. It doesn't matter who they are. They could be 
you know, I don't know, the biggest person in the world. But if they genuinely on day one don't believe what you're going for and what the sole purpose of this fabric or this molecule is meant to do, then there's no point in even starting the project. And that's a hard lesson to learn because when you're a young designer, you need money to survive. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's a balance between um, surviving and, uh, and, and seeing the light of day with stuff. But I think, yeah, the biggest, I guess the biggest message that I would say is it's less about what they think and more about finding the ones that think what you think, if that makes sense. I don't know if that answers it, but... Good morning. Welcome to Miami. I hope the heat isn't suffocating you. Yeah, I'm definitely an Arctic pole cat. I'm like, I'm, I'm at my best in the North Pole, so this is horrific for me. <laughs> I can understand that. Um, my question is maybe a little bit off subject. It's relating to how you protect your innovation. Mm. Do you have any challenges in yeah. that area? Yeah, so when I started out, I didn't have the money to patent, didn't have the money to pay lawyers to look at IP, etc. So I just had to protect everything with NDAs. I was just like walking around with this paper, like sign this and we'll speak and then I realized like actually do you know what like, I'm a creative person if somebody wants to copy my idea go ahead I'll come up with another and like I know that gets more complicated when you get on further and um, as as kind of money came into the business we can now afford to patent so we patent everything we have a great IP lawyer everything is documented on a daily basis and um, it's very rigid and structuralized um, but but from sort of people starting out I would say don't worry about your IP like everyone's always like your IP is your greatest thing. Yes, if you've got one IP, but if you've got 50 million, like, so all of these dyes are like, that. everything is different. So IP is, it's subjective. It's like, what, how do you find and navigate? It's like almost writing a script or a poet. And it's like, okay, what have they done? And how do I get around that? So somebody is going to copy you in the world. You just have to do it. I'd say do it first and do it better um, in whatever guys that means for you. But yeah, I think um, protect yourself where you, you know, be clever about it, but um, don't, don't lose sleep over it at the beginning. And then when you can pay people to do it for you, then do that. <laughs> or make friends with lawyers, it's always good. Yeah. Yes. Uh -huh. Hi there. I'm so impressed with what you're doing, and Thank I have you. so many questions. Uh, it seems like what you're doing is fairly vast. Um, so if you were to focus on one industry that you think would benefit most, what industry would it be? Mm -hmm. For example, if we were to take makeup, um, and you mentioned that your line will come up, uh, will come out soon, but are there big uh, brands or big players in the field that you feel like would um, benefit, but also follow your lead in a way mm -hmm. where like change can happen and substantial change in uh, a category or a market can take yeah. place? For me, it's um, two industries, so healthcare and then art, so exhibitions. So healthcare for me and like um, actually helping people on a daily basis is really important. And the only real reason I do all of this is to provide me with the money to do all of that because, yeah, it's, it's tough in the healthcare industry. But the in terms of like getting new innovations out, it's very rigid. But, um, but the way to do that is by creating stuff in using other people and using other projects as catalysts to be able to create those materials that you can then slot nicely in to help people. But I feel like art also does that. And I say art like art, what is art? You know what I mean? But it's like, if you, if you can create, and so when I started, I was like, whatever I create has to be able to sit in the science museum and the VNA. So like, or, you know, it has to be as beautiful as it is innovative um, and by that then I'm getting the, the biggest amount of audience so you're getting the kids that are going to the VNA to the National History Museum but then you're also getting the kids that are going to the Science Museum because I went to both as a kid and I, I feel like that is a very important place to inspire um, because they're gonna they're, they're the, like the future and they're the ones that are going to go on and um, hopefully when we're in the positions that are higher up we can enable them a little bit better than our elders perhaps do in these big uh, organizations but yeah I think getting stuff into the real world in a, in a healthcare point of view um, and a, in changing people's opinions on their daily life. Or if I think my job is, is well done if at the end of the day someone goes, oh my God, that's amazing. Like, I never thought of that in that way. Like, I never thought of the world in that way or I never thought of myself in that way. So that's, I guess, more interesting than working with a big, I don't know, cosmetic company. This just pays the bills and allows me to create new science because at the end of the day, money isn't, you know, 
amazing, but it gives you choices and freedom to explore, which, um, you know, it's very difficult in science to get grants and you spend a half of your life applying for grants and then you get to do one experiment. So it's a different way of doing it. Hello. Um, mm -hmm. I am a, a nurse's aide. I've worked in the, the medical field for 20 years, from nursing home to telemetry to ortho and the, and the hospitals and everything. And I've been dressing people from eight to 40 people within two hours. So I decided to become a uh, designer. I studied co cosmetology. I came to Florida to learn how to do makeup. So I totally agree with everything you're saying. Thank you. And, and they're like, well, why are you learning makeup, hair? What are you going to be, one or the other? It, it all blends in to the same thing because yeah. it's one body and as Patricia Fields would tell you, it's a story yeah. that people create and as soon as people meet you, they see your story. So, um, do you have a card? Honest to God, I think you're amazing. <laughs> oh. <laughs> cool. You have media, you have uh, social media? Yeah, yeah, so my Instagram is the Unseen Alchemist. Okay, yeah. perfect. I, I can't stop thinking about uh, a foundation for makeup yeah. that yeah. only changes your color. Sephora is going to be empty. Oh, wow. Yeah, <laughs> and our savings are going to be... <laughs> but what if it changes as well to like your skin and is alive with you? So, you know, it, like the, the idea of race and skin color is just insane. So, like, how, why are we letting old men in laboratories dictate what color our skin should be? Yeah, amazing. Yeah. Thank you, Lauren. A Thank big you. round of applause, please, for Lauren. Thank you.